Today we're going to talk about Chopper Reed, and he was an Australian criminal who wrote several crime novels and children's books, and between the ages of 20 and 38, he spent only 13 months outside of prison walls. He contracted hepatitis C after being cut in prison, and he died of cancer, liver cancer, at the age of 58. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, so this is an interview with Tara Brown from Australia 60 Minutes. This guy had a horrible childhood. He was in foster care his first five years. He had a whole lot of abuse. He had some physical beatings by his father. He was in mental institutions in his teens and had electroconvulsive therapy or shock treatment. And then he spent 23 years in jail for kidnapping and malicious wounding. He made a business when he was younger of abducting lower level criminals and torturing them in exchange for money. And they let him out. And he became that best selling crime author. That's it. There could be no more fitting place than Melbourne's Pentridge Prison for Chopper Reed's final interview. Now closed, Chopper spent nearly 20 years of his life inside these penitentiary walls. So, weeks from death, it was here he decided to finally come clean on a crime he has never been convicted of, murder. Tonight, he's admitting to four homicides. Well, are you prepared to tell the truth today? Yeah, of course I am. Why is that? Because that's what it's all about. This is the last interview. The last picture show. Does your word mean anything? Don't question me about my bloody well word. That's all I'm saying to you. That's it. Four is all you're getting, and that four, that's, that's it. Four, that's it. That's it. I haven't killed any more than that. And don't try to tell me, don't try to make out that I have. I guess the point is, uh, you have said in the past, you put a television camera in the room and you lay your head off. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course I yeah, <laughs> right. But I'm, uh, I'm telling the truth now. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, some lovely elements to this. Uh, I block on, yes, of course, that he's telling the truth. So uh, immediately I think, mm, maybe you're not going to tell the truth. Uh, and, but then at the end when he says, uh, uh, telling the truth now, there's direct gaze, which tells you something about anybody who says, you know, a, 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 uh, somebody telling, telling the truth uh, or somebody lying will not look at you. Uh, sometimes they won't look at you and sometimes they'll really look at you. So so, you know, there is no one indicator of somebody being uh, deceptive. And here, I think you see uh, looking away and looking directly at as both indicators of potential uh, deception here. So interesting. Last picture show, uh, he, he uses that metaphor there and uh, basically signaling to us, this is gonna be entertainment. This is gonna be spectacular, what you're gonna see. He soothes around the knuckles. So lots of protection and soothing around there, um, but relaxes on, of course, uh, so, so look, I think there's going to be in this some real entertainment. I think there's going to be some truth telling. I think there's going to be some deception. I think, um, I think he doesn't quite know at this point, you know, where he's going to go with this one. So let's see, from my point of view, let's see how this rolls out. Let's see what he comes up with. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Right on this intro video here, there's a noose hanging from the rafters. I don't know if anybody else noticed it. The rope looks brand new, and I think they probably put this there to walk under it. And th I think that was super strange. It looks brand new. His skin and eyes are yellow here, so I think if there's some kind of sickness going on, I don't know anything about this case or this person. This is jaundice or maybe liver failure that's going on where there's a chemical in your liver called bilirubin which comes from breaking down some red blood cells. And this can be a reaction to chemotherapy. So there, I don't, maybe he has cancer here, uh, if, if that's correct. But this behavior here is artificial confidence, trying to appear dominant and in control. His body gives it away pretty quickly. His hands tighten up and pull back to protect his genitals. This is an unconscious response to stress and fear. He breaks eye contact. While he's trying to be dominant, he breaks eye contact and looks away and looks down at the floor. There's repetition of words and reassurance and comfort. And right he, for him, and there's a high shift in blink rate upward to about 60 plus. This is how often we blink is an indicator of stress up high. And the lower, the less often we blink is an indicator of focus, most likely. So this is all a complete statement here. A lot of this speaks to a false bravado, a, a 
being more domineering than dominant and being more controlling than in control. This is deception. I think we're going to see some interesting stuff. I want to pitch this to you guys while we're here on YouTube. Let's do something different this time. Each one of these videos that we're about to show you is going to have a little crime associated with it. What if we, each one of us, would give a percentage on likelihood of truth for each one as we're going through these? You guys okay. down with that? Yeah, I'm down yeah that's down. good. Give that's it, great. Give yeah. it give it All right. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so yes, he is in liver failure. This is days before he died. So all that yellow and all that jaundice is tied to his liver failure. And I think his liver cancer, Scott, you said. But as he's going through this, one of the things that I will point out is someone in the medical profession is going to say that's because this enzyme in his body is not reacting correctly. So if there's something we missed because of biology, because of medicine, please put it in the comments. You may know better than we do. If it's just your opinion, okay. But if it's a medical fact, we're interested in that. Um, interestingly, he's got a pronounced grief muscle. We always talk about the grief muscle being this arch here. That's part of who he is. It's just how he's wired. Now, I'll also say this. If you've never lived in a dodgy neighborhood, you probably never met this guy. But I've met this guy a bunch of times when I was poor and living in some pretty rough spots. And you know the guy who's funny, funny, funny until he is not. And that's their way of being on top of things. And that false bravado is kind of this gig they have. I would bet you that people that knew him would say, yeah, he's funny until he's not, until he snaps. That pronounced grief muscle will see him use it to some degree but that request for approval when he says all you're getting is four all you're getting is four and don't question my bloody word then he moves to an eye block and uh, chase to your point he closes and covers his genitals and more importantly he's milling his hands at the same time so he's created some sacred spaces i refer to it meaning i make my own space and then do something that is repetitious to make myself comfortable in that space and mark i'm with you he eye blocks when he says i'm telling the truth and then he makes hard eye contact. And I'm telling the truth now. I, I think if you're looking for what I would call the truth, meaning fact, factual information and fact-based truth, you're probably not going to get it. I think he's done this so many times and he's created this kind of act that we're seeing. He stood on stage. He's been in comedy shows. He's got an act. That's what we're seeing. Scott, what do you got? I agree. Now, it's important to keep in mind that that the the face is actually a dual delivery system so in other words it can send two messages at the same time with expressions you may see part of one expression and then another completely different expression but they're blended together that's what uh ekman uh that's how he approaches that or talks about how how expressions can be blended together to give you an odd uh combination of one feeling or one expression and another one so so let's pay attention to that here because we see a lot of that going on here and the two here that we see the two what it looks like is grief and then false confidence and the false confidence is this almost stoic straight face which is the false one and then the 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 stress and grief is that that knitting of his brow the globella right there how it comes together and he's got like greg was talking about that upside down uh horseshoe there that we always term as the uh the grief muscle and then he says yeah of course i am we see that eyelid flutter and then they're closed and that indicates distancing with it with the eye blocking there and his head winces almost like he was being smacked um and his eyes close as he answers and his brain's trying to move him away from that situation uh subconsciously i guess you'd say because from a psychological standpoint that's he doesn't want to hear all this um and when he says that's what's all about the last interview the last picture show he's adding qualifiers no no need to add uh qualifiers unless you're trying to make something sound bigger and greater than it is and she says does your word mean anything then he init he initiates several of these large illustrators or regulators trying to shut her down because i think he's afraid she's going to get into that where he talked about earlier in other interviews how he wasn't honest and i think they talked about it before this so i think he's trying to shut her down at that point so they don't get into that so we'll believe what he's getting ready to say um and at the same time his arms close up his arms get tight around his chest around his body there towards his torso and uh his head shakes no and all these indicate he's trying to shut that conversation down. So, Mark, what happened to Desi Costello? Well, well Desi Costello was standing here. He was here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, you're an imbecile, Des, you know. You, you, you gotta get it, you know. You're an imbecile. Fucking whack, bang. 
Outside the Leinster Arms Hotel in Collingwood, Chopper is taking me through this bizarre reenactment of a murder 42 years ago. Go on, put your hand up. Right, this one? Yeah, he packed it and then he went like that. Right. It was an organised hit on union heavy Desmond Costello. Chopper Reed was just 17 years of age and this was his first murder. All right, Chase, what do you got? Now that the interviewer gave him permission to move her around a little bit, his confidence has escalated, and this is extremely telling about his behavior. He is permission-based, and he definitely would not want anybody to know that. So his right hand is kind of holding a gun the whole time. You can see it kind of pushed into that position. I think that is pretty genuine. And he even goes through some of the dialogue almost nonsensically before the shooting reenactment. But he was taking charge of her there because, A, he got permission from her first uh, because he would not have otherwise done that. And then he started feeling more and more confident. And I think that helped him to sell the act. As far as a percentage goes on this one, I'm going to say a 61 that this crime did occur. Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, I think he's he's that permission-based guy because being in prison so long, you can't do anything without asking if it's okay to do it, uh, in most cases, from what I understand. But he awkwardly moves her into that position, and he begins imitating the guy that he murdered. But he doesn't give any upfront information. He doesn't give any much background on that at all. And then there's no reasoning behind why he shot him. There's no reason behind why they're arguing, arguing or why they're even there at that point. And then the... The awkwardness of all this just screams deception to me. And this is this I think this is something he heard and he's repeating. I think it's a story he's that he thought might have been cool sounding, but I don't I don't think he did it. That's and I think that I think it's hundred percent deceptive. I don't think it's true at all. I'll end it there. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is part of an act. Um, way back when, if you think about something like guerrilla theater where you take shock and you involve somebody in the discussion so that now you can plant more information in their head, I think what he's doing here when he asks for permission, that has nothing to do with what he's doing. He's wanting to get his hands on her so he can engage her. This is Con Man 101. He engages her physically, and then she's part of the story, so it's easier for her to believe. And she's awkward and not paying attention to all the details because she's feeling invaded. If a person does this to you, be very cautious because you're working something. If you ever notice, like people on a bus who have ever been conned out of money, the guy gives them something to handle. It's Con Man 101 to get you involved in the story. Chase, you do hypnosis stuff, a bunch of stage hypnosis. I think a lot of those guys who do comedy and that kind of thing, it's this kind of thing. They get them involved. They feel like it. And I know there are people who do hypnosis and people who don't. I don't know anything about it. Just know when I watch them, I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of that engagement in some of these shyster guys. Once you get that compliance, the person will start to believe it. You, we've talked about this before. If I can convince you that George Washington had wooden teeth and you don't believe me, and then I prove I'm right, I'm always right. That whole primacy effect and all that kind of thing gives me authority. I think if you pay much attention to this guy, you would see he did this all the time. He put his hands on people. He'd get away with whatever he could. In this case, he clearly is not going to just casually reach out to this woman. First of all, he's a thug. Everybody thinks he's a thug. Here's, I, I, I don't know Australian TV, but I would venture to say this woman's probably a treasure of Australian TV. You're probably not going to manhandle her as much as you would without asking a question. I bet he's not going to ask that same question of everybody. Um, Start paying attention. When he says something and he's uncomfortable right afterward, he'll say, you know, you know, you know. Start paying attention here because you'll start to see it. I'll give us about a 33% chance it's true. I don't know where all the detail comes from. But look, again, this guy's been around. This guy's done a bunch of stuff. He's clearly, clearly no saint. I mean, I read that he did horrific torture to these guys who are low-level cr criminals and then would take make them pay him to stop, including things like cutting off fingers and toes. So the guy's no, you know, he's no choir boy, but certainly that doesn't mean he's done everything he says. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it's an interesting situation because, yes, yeah, she, the, the interviewer is a treasured Australian, though so is Chopper, a treasured Australian. That's a good point. In, in British terms, he's a bit like a mad Frankie Fraser, who is a, used to be a fantastic gent until he cut your ears off. He himself was an East End gangster primarily, but then an entertainer. And you could actually, you know, you could get on one of his tours around the East End and have mad Frankie Fraser take you around and say, that's where, you know, that's where I shot Jack the Hat McVitie, or that's where 
where I cut so and so's ears off. So we've got to understand that Chopper here has had films made about him. He's a celebrity. So when we see this maneuver, he's simply setting, from my point of view, he's simply setting the stage because you'll see him clock the camera and go, are we in shot at the moment? So I think he knows enough about film, TV, stage to be able to go, let's let's set up the, the shot here. I would say my bias goes towards uh, this is a true crime because later on in another video we'll see him not include anybody else and and act out the the crime in a way that cannot be or potentially is not accurate whereas here he's trying to create accuracy you look do the choreography put your arm put your arm up here do, play the part of this other person so what else do we get from him um he gets into the feeling of the dialogue he really kind of acts it out and 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 uh, though he's not quite certain he can't he's not quite certain what the other person said he's kind of certain about the the feelings in there and he doesn't have a lot of vocabulary for the feelings but i think that's the kind of character he is he wasn't around a lot of of, of detailed vocabulary around feelings he will tend to just fill it in with kind of profanity along the way to show there was there was fear or love or aggression it's all the same you know f word that will be used for, for basically any feeling that's going on uh, i would say and again you see that a lot in the east end of of london you know there's only there's one word for everything that you feel and do essentially um okay so um so he has some detail here and he doesn't have some detail here but on a 50 50 bet my bias would be towards there is some veracity there is some truth to him being involved in this crime did it go exactly the way and we're going to see and somebody going down a shoot and you know he's an entertainer so he's going to make a good story out of it but is he involved in it i'd say he's involved in it the pub's keg cellar became Des Costello's temporary tomb. Danny's yeah, gone. <laughs> uh, when you threw, why are you laughing? <laughs> Danny goes. That's, that's you, it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but, and you thought he was dead? <coughs> yeah, yeah. Dead as a doornail, as far as I was concerned. But he wasn't, was he? Well, well the next morning he was, uh, still, still a bit of a, a bit of a cackle. So what did you do then? You step on him. Right. We just went do it like that. We just took a bloody, ugh, just a bit of a, bit of a. Ugh. That was all it took. Did you know that you had that in you? Uh, then? Yeah, of course I did. Yeah. Blase and brutal, the 17-year-old chopper and an accomplice carried the body of Desmond Costello a few blocks to dump it here, in the shadow of what locals call the Collingwood Shot Tower. Police found his body. They just never found his murderer. Were you surprised that you got away with it? No. Why? There's no one around. No one, no. <laughs> this is half past five in the bloody, uh, whatever it was morning on, in 1971 in Collingwood. So you don't think anyone saw you? Well, if they, if they did see us, they, they turned their head quickly and went the other way. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so just one thing to pay attention to. And go watch him doing stand-up or whatever kind of thing that is. I mean, he did some stand up and story tell. And when he's uncomfortable and uncertain how he's being perceived, he does a chained elephant. He's doing the chained elephant here, which makes me red flag him, red flag him, red flag him. Whatever happened in that first part, he's more demonstrative in the, the chained elephant than he is in anything else he talks about. Then he goes, I don't think anybody saw me. That's good enough for me. I really don't believe him now, whether it's about all the story or just this part. Scott, we got. It. All right. Um, when she says, why are you laughing? Uh, and he says, down he goes, he starts off, he's still got that odd, quiet laughing going on. It's so awkward and it's really, really detailed. And he's been really, really detailed up to this point, but this isn't detailed at all. He just tells the overview of what happened. He's got this continuous, weird, half-hearted laughter. And that's, again, that suggests he's repeating someone else's story. I think he heard what happened. I think he's repeating it at this point. And all of his answers are sketchy and they're really quiet. They're really kind of almost muffled. And he's doing that mumbling thing as well. And he says, when, and then when he says, I stepped on his throat, 
he's acting this out and he's doing it too weak. He would have done a stomp thing. He would have done something to make it more graphic, especially if he's an actor, especially if he wants to get the point across. But if he didn't do it, he doesn't feel good about it. I think his brain's saying, dude, we better chill out on this. We better cool down a little bit. I don't think he, I don't think he did it. And I'm not going to waste my time on the, on the last question because I think it's painfully cringeworthy. And I don't, I don't think he did it. And then Chase, you, what do you yeah. got? Well, I need a percentage from you really quick. Oh, I didn't think I needed to put percentage one in there. Of I, true. Yeah, Look, I think for it's me a, to say 100%, nobody did anything, I, I'd say 90, 90% he didn't, 10% he did. Okay. Yeah, I'm 100% he didn't. 100%. I no. can't be 15, sure of that. I'll kick it off with, uh, I gave this one 15% uh, truth. I think some elements are real. Some probably he heard in a story about somebody. There's artificial laughter, the confirmation glances back and forth just to make sure he's being listened to. And when he says this dead as a doornail, he's looking away down the street, way lower sense of self-confidence. And when he's saying I stepped on the guy's throat, there's this is just increased posturing. There's insecure arm movement, lowered self-confidence again. I don't think this detail is accurate at all. And uh, when she says, did you know you had that in you? There's hesitancy. So here's how that's deceptive. Here are the deception indicators, a hesitation, a loss of fluency, which means we have trouble speaking clearly, eye contact avoidance, confirmation glance, and the chained elephant that Greg was just talking about. That's what we're talking about. If you ever hear us talk about clusters, that's the cluster of behavior that looks like deception for all of us. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so the laugh is is a little bit of a, an issue. It does seem odd. Uh, we'll hear it further down the line as well. It'll come up uh, again. Uh, we've got to understand that uh, there's a personality type here that is a total outsider. Um, and so there's, there's going to be some odd, you know, there's going to be some really odd behaviors going on here. Some really odd behaviors going on here. There isn't any passion in that stamp you're absolutely right and later on we'll see some way more passionate performances but these are still performances and and but they're just better passion they're they're melodramatic uh almost um so is he so is he devoid of feeling because it didn't happen or is it devoid of feeling because he is devoid of feeling um, he doesn't have, a, again, a big vocabulary for ideas around feeling. We'll see him act out uh, aggression and violence, but in a melodramatic way, a non-realistic way. So, look, th there's an issue for me here in terms of, I, I think, because he doesn't really act this out very well. It's not very descriptive that I'm, I'm of the opinion that I'm not sure this part of the story happened. I'm pretty sure that he is part of something to do with this at the start, but it runs out of, of, of uh, detail here. But I'm also at the same time going, he's not somebody who's going to have a lot of feeling that we would recognize. And so we'll probably be at a loss sometimes to, to go, well, that's a bit unpassionate and a bit cold well yeah it will be because he is the kind of person he'll cut off your ears because it's because it's wednesday uh so so uh yeah i'm still i'm still uh, over the 50 percent that he's something to do with this but this stuff doesn't seem very accurate to me what do you reckon has made you who you are mark i don't know but do you think that anything in your past, uh, you know, the fact that you yourself were attacked as a five-year-old or six-year-old, yeah. um, do you think, you know, the fact that you were in an orphanage for a time, do you think the fact that your dad loved guns and, and you, you know, you described him as mad, do you think that shaped you? I've never stopped to, um, to analyse the, uh, I've never stopped to analyse it. Um, I've never, I've never dwelled on it or given it any great thought. What, what makes me tick? It really, it, it amuses me when other people say, "Oh, I know you." Uh, why is that? Oh, I've spent so much time with you. I know you. We don't know what makes anyone tick. 
you know. We, we, everyone's a mystery to everyone, and everyone is a mystery to themselves, I believe. All right, Chase, what do you got? I'm going to leave the body language to you guys on this one. But there is one thing here that I think is amazing. It's a, re a re revelation that's such a perfect example of psychology in general. Right here, we hear him saying, no one knows anyone else. Everybody's a mystery to everyone, and we're all a mystery to ourselves. I've paraphrased that. So this shows one powerful tool that you can use today, right away. If you want to know what other people secretly feel about themselves and the world, ask them what they think most people feel and how most people behave. Because we tend to think everybody else is just like us. So that he thinks that should make sense to someone else. So we're hearing his inability here to understand himself, which is real, and his lifelong inability to get to know somebody else despite spending these long hours with them. He can't understand the idea at all. So he naturally assumes that other people must be idiots. No one can possibly get to know somebody. We are all a mystery. And I think, yes, he is absolutely prone to doing violent and crazy stuff, but only when people are looking and only when it serves his reputation and his desire to appear to be a certain way because he's continually having to define himself because he struggles with that. And that's going to come up here in just a few minutes. Scott, what do you got? All right, when she mentions the abuse, he adapts with it by rubbing his mouth, and his mouth stays open like he's getting ready to say something. And I think he wants to say something or he's thinking about saying something. And then he makes an expression that indicates pain as he's going back and forth a little bit there, almost swaying back and forth. Um, he gives the answer a lot of thought. and then, uh, But he also has a lot of, of uh, eye blocking, and he's scratching his head as an adapter. I think that, that whole thing really bothered him, as it would. Uh, think about something that horrible from your childhood like that. Then I think at that point he's moving forward and he starts speaking from the heart. And I think this is the first time we see him be himself. And he's he's speaking with sadness and concern. Again, we see a, that blend of, of emotions there or expressions at that point. Um, but I think this is the first time we're actually seeing him be himself. And it's, he seemed, you know, almost, no, I'm not going to say stoic. But he seemed like he was really being honest at that point. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, Chase, my, one of my notes says the last statement speaks volumes when he says everyone is a mystery to themselves. Because he needs approval so badly, if I'm in the room with him and I'm trying to get him to talk and I know that, I'm going to say, wait a minute, what do you mean? You mean you're, you're impulsive and unpredictable? Or, or would you say unhinged? I would go after him to show that he has no control over who he is and that he, all this bad boy he thinks he is just say, the product of and poke on him for that because he does show some emotion in this one. As a matter of fact, one of the more interesting things I've seen in a while, I'll go back to her. Tara, eye blocks just thinking about his past before she talks about him being hurt as a child or being attacked as a child. I believe when he says, I've never stopped to analyze it, I believe him wholeheartedly because he does the who knows face, or what I would say, the who to thunk it face. And by that, I mean his chin boss is involved, the sides of his mouth draw down, his, his lower lip pushes up in the center, at the same time his forehead is up. That's a, I never even considered. So I do believe what he's saying there. And then this is one of the more powerful things you'll ever know about the guy, is he probably has no idea why he's done some of the stupid things he's done. And there's probably underneath there, some guy who is sitting and going, well, what could I have done differently? But he has to keep up this image, this manufactured process in order for him to keep his reputation, for him to keep in front of people and probably to sell books and everything else. Now, it's the end of his life. He's probably also having, regardless of what he says later, probably also having some thoughts about his life. People don't go introspective the way he did if they don't have any internal thought about self and things they've done wrong. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so obviously what he's saying there isn't um, rational if or, or, or links with any decent philosophy or belief system that you can't know another person uh, it, somewhat. I mean, in, in their entirety, yeah, okay, that's a stretch, but somewhat. And you cannot know yourself somewhat. Well, his philosophy is 
uh, he he doesn't believe in the idea of relationships at all and doesn't believe in the ability for anybody to do introspection. So obviously this belief system is a massive outlier from most other stuff on the planet. He really has put himself in a tiny, tiny percentage of people that are going to discount completely being able to understand anything about another human being and anything about themselves. It's a massive blanket statement. Of course, it's, it is, you know, it'd be nice to delve into the body language, but ultimately that blows everything else away because it is such an extraordinary statement that when you sit there in front of somebody who goes, you can't know anything about anybody else or yourself, it's like, okay, well, that's what we're dealing with now then, is it? Like, that's quite, a, that's quite an outsider character we've got now. And so what, are, what else are they going to be capable of if they're capable of that extreme belief system? All I get left with is this person is at an extreme, because I believe him. I do believe that he thinks you can't know anything about anybody else or yourself. What an extremely isolated place to be in. You probably couldn't be more isolated uh, than that. I, he'll have spent some time in isolation as well, I, I imagine, which is true human isolation. Anyway, that's all I got on that one. You guys can call me out on it. <laughs> I just figured you were sitting there having a moment. Never yeah, know. Yeah, I don't think just, <laughs> I'm trying to look like I'm getting, getting ready to talk. But the violence, you know, and, and what violence? the absolute fascination with guns. Where did well, that what, come what, from? What, what violence? There's no violence in shooting someone. There's no violence. There's no, ah! There's no um, <laughs> blood spurting out all over the kitchen and ah! Yeah, but no, you've you've told me you've, you've probably stabbed up to a dozen people. You've jumped on people's heads. You've yeah, 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 done. I mean, you're violent, Mark. No, I. Oh God, am I? There's violence, and then there's violence. I mean, only weeks before his I death, the, Chopper still had the energy the to theatrically the make his chilling gun. point. Is that camera following me? <laughs> you put the mouth on the on the side of the gutter, there, and you get him to open their mouth along the edge of the gutter. Well, and you stand back and you go, Kah! smash to the back of the head, Ooh, right on the edge of the gutter. Bang, that's violent. That's violent. You start seeing the blood roll out, oh, that's violent. That's an act of violence. And that's, you're starting on an act of violence there. That's getting towards an act of violence, in my book. All right, Chase, what do you got? What an idiot. <laughs> uh, the facial expressions of disgust in this interviewer are chef's kiss amazing yes. this is pure and right as he's sitting down the look on her face again is just priceless she is witnessing a little boy who's trying to impress her and i think she thinks that this display of artificial toughness is maybe a little cute and I think he wants to appear tough, so he calls it violent. Then maybe that's not really tough, so he backs it down a notch. That's an act of violence. Then he backs it down a notch. That's starting at an act of violence. Then there's a little more back down that's getting towards an act of violence. Then he realizes the silliness, so he distances one more time in my book. So I think he's then embarrassed and, and wants to check the camera and kind of shifts his body so he can be observed for a second. This is towards the end of the clip, not when he asks, is that camera following me? Right at the end of the clip, when he shifts his body language, this is so the camera and the interviewer, Tara, can observe him for a second. It's his opportunity to be observed. After all of this grandiose stuff, now you can take a look at me and, and just get a good look. Mark, I have to go with you after this one. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this is directly from the book of Mark Chopper Reed. Uh, <laughs> and, and I've not read any of his uh, children's uh, books, though, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel ashamed that I didn't introduce my kids to them because I'm sure they're, <laughs> they're wonderful, wonderful uh, pieces of, of outsider, outsider art. 
Um, so yeah, look, there is no, there's no gradations to it at all. Like, you know, the video in the earlier video around the crime, we see almost kind of nothing happening. Like, ah, oh, I just caved in your head to this one, which is like, ah, it's a German expressionist. It's Nosferatu. It literally is. If you go and look at those images of, of, of the film Nosferatu, you will see those hands. So I think he is directly mirroring stuff that he's seen in horror films. And that doesn't mean he's had to have seen Nosferatu because that is one of the earliest horror films and everything, every vampire film after that does those hands because it's it's the it's the germ of of every horror film that ever ever happened pretty much there there are some examples of others but um so there's no gradations in him he clocks the camera again to say am i going to get in shot uh on this one it's a barnstorming uh german expressionist performance uh i would say i've not seen his show but i would say this is from his show this is it's pretty Australian, isn't it? Because it's, it's that Crocodile Dundee moment of that's not a knife. This is a knife. Like, that's not violence. This is violence. <laughs> it's, it's just genius. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. I don't think anything like that happened. Um, but I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's act. Um, but it does tell us something that he can't reproduce anything of what potentially was his violence at the time it's a film version of it it's a it's a mock-up it's a mockery of it which is again extraordinary uh scott what do you got on this one all right yeah you guys have covered pretty much everything this is where he attempts to get to give the impression that he believes stabbing and shooting aren't violent acts this is this is all acting like like you're saying we're seeing uh, like you were saying chase these large expressions of concern disgust and and false concern through all this i think it's, i think you're right he's trying to impress her and trying to to not that he's gonna like start dating her or anything but he wants to look cool in front of her you know so i think he's trying to look all really tough and bad and stuff but it's just it's not working for him greg what do you got yeah, we're all on the same page. Chase, I called it incremental badassery. I will. It's not really. Well, maybe. Well, hold, but it's according to me. He just keeps adding that little gradation. And more importantly, he fishes for the opportunity. It's, it's actually pretty good theater when I watch it because he uses a provocative statement in body language to get her to ask a question when he goes, he does a condemning brow. To, so she will fish and say, what do you mean it's not? And when she does respond, then he goes, he eye blocks. He intentionally stammers and stutters over her. And when he says, what violence, he's now going to get his chance to go and talk about his badassery. This is showman. This is all, everything he's doing here is part of a show. I agree with you, Mark, whether he's done it on the stage or somewhere else, he's had it in his head for a while. And she, I love her disgust as well. It's a beautiful thing. And then he goes into this whole thing about saying, well, it is, this is not violent. This is violent. And then he gets up and does more of that same theater involving you in the theater again. And then he needs you to feel that he's violent. And when you don't, he's got to go back and finish that last thing and finish the opportunity out when he says, well, that's according to me. Right. Beautiful piece of theater. That's all I think we're seeing. The secret to winning a war is to, is to love something you, you, um, your enemy doesn't like it. My enemy didn't even like being in jail. I loved it. My enemy didn't like being in haste division. I loved it. My enemy didn't like um, having to get up every Monday morning and watch watch for low-flying pocket knives and low-flying hammers and whether they're going to get attacked that day and who they'd have to attack that day to survive. I loved it, right? Did you really love well, it? Well, I loved the, 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 um, the cut and thrust of, um, of uh, all this sort of stuff going on in the jail. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is more of the show. He's got a manifesto he's selling. His body language is doing it because this is something he said before. This might even be right from his stage act, Mark, when you were talking yeah. about earlier. He conditions the questions when he says did you really love it he says or when she says that he goes i love the uh and he st stammers off a little bit interestingly he's exactly wrong you don't win wars by loving war you win wars by being done with it none of us want to be shot we all want to shoot the other guy that's not part of what you get but i do get his point he's trying to say i was good at it. i i was like a pig and and that's why i was better at it it's his manifesto and he's just reinforcing what he's saying chase what do you got yeah, totally agree with you. And none of us uh, wants to love war more than the other person. Like General Pat said, uh, 
It's about making the other person die for their country, not about dying for yours. So this is just a childish display of behavior here uh, to appear tough that you might see in like a 15-year-old. And I think this might be just when he stopped maturing. And you can hear him say, I loved it, right? But this large inhale to make his point, this is selling and not telling. And when she calls him out on it, she says, did you really love it? There's instantaneous backpedaling, rephrasing, confirmation glances back to the interviewer, a loss of fluency, which is when we, uh, it's, it's more difficult for us to speak, and then an, a spike in ambiguity. So this has hallmarks of deception and the hallmarks of kind of an immature, tough kid appearance exterior uh, of a tough kid. Mark? Yeah, I think he's trying to put forward the idea that he's written the art of war. It's, it's, you know, maybe I'm sure it was in the the library, and maybe he had a little look at it, and and he saw a little bit of it, and when I oh, I've got a version of that in my head, I reckon I, yeah, you gotta you gotta love things more than anyway. It's a complete mess because because his negative of the enemy gesture is the same as his positive of him gesture what i would expect if it re really were an antithesis is you'd have the negative of the of the enemy and you'd have something different for you because it's different what's happening it would be in a strongly different place and a whole different kind of gesture mechanism he doesn't have any of that so he's, he's making this stuff up as the the idea of being erudite in you know the the art the art of war according to the book of of chopper um now what comes out of it for me though is that uh his idea of he loves the cut and thrust and there's and there's a, a delay in that uh, uh, of, uh, he loves the cut and thrust and all this sort of stuff so he hasn't got words for it he hasn't got words for it but in that culmination of not being able to find the words and not being be able to find the gestures for it what i see is quite chaotic gestures i would put forward what he loves is the chaos of it because basically everything he does is ultimately antisocial and society all societies are structures there are no societies that are chaotic Okay, they are structured in some way. Just some of them look chaotic to us because we're not part of that society. He loves the chaos that comes when you put somebody with an antisocial personality like himself into the rest of society. It's mayhem. When you put that antisocial personality into his society, he's just another criminal who does, does stuff that criminals have to do, like stick to certain rules, kill somebody if they've fallen out of line, not feel too much about stuff. He's good at the rules of criminal. He's not good at the rules of the rest of society. And he's fallen in love somewhat with that chaos. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Scott, what do you think? I think you guys are right. I think he lives by this. I think this is this is what he tells everybody. It's his thing to say because he's using these big old illustrators, and he's it's coming out a pretty good clip. His volume's up. His diction is about as clear as it's been up to this point. His eye contact is hard and it's direct, and he keeps it keeps that happening with her. And when he's doing that that arm thing, his arm goes to right and left, right and left. When he makes his final point, it goes down at an angle. That's the only differences I've seen there that goes going back and forth and then down like that. And I I think this is the first true excitement we've seen coming out of him. I mean, really from the heart, excited about something because he's told this story before, be it to a cellmate, be it to a group of people like, oh, what do you think? Or when he's on his stage thing or whatever he's doing, I think that's the thing that he, he sells. And at, at the same time, it, it looks like that he didn't waste his life in prison. You know, all that time he spent in prison, it gives the impression that he was in control of it and that he that he felt like this about it. He liked doing it. Even though they didn't like it, he was above that and he liked it. And he liked the thrust and all that stuff in there. I think it, I think it's his attempt to, to be his, like you were saying, Greg, his manifesto or his creed to go in there and be like, yeah, I was all about prison. Well, what are you going to say? I hated it the whole time. It was horrible. You know, I got my ears, I had my ears cut off. I asked somebody to cut my ear. What are you going to say at that point? So I think you're right. I think, I think all you guys are right. I think this is just something he's, what are you going to do at that point? He's going to try to make the best of it. So 
to, to say he was comfortable. We good? Yeah. Right. Wait, wait, wait. Chopper, you got gun? You got gun, huh? Until now, Chopper has always claimed the shooting was in self-defense, that Sammy the Turk was armed and part of a drug-dealing gang that wanted to get rid of Chopper, the standover man. I was taking their money. You know, was a, I was driving the western suburbs crazy. You know? I was standing over bloody virtually half of them and uh, taking their money. They didn't like it. You know? But on the night he shot him, Sammy the Turk didn't pull a gun on Chopper. He was unarmed. When I killed Sammy the Turk, that wasn't a self-defence. That was outright murder. Sorry, it shouldn't be swearing, but that was outright murder. I, I told the, um, the armory squad that night that, that it was self-defence. I said he grabbed the gun out of the front of me pants and I grabbed the shotgun out and click, click, click here and I've gone bang through the head. And I thought to myself, if anyone believes this story, they got, they, they got rocks in the head. But the jury did anyway, believe Chopper them, and he was acquitted. Everyone swallowed it. Oh, I couldn't understand. And next thing you know, the jury would come back and said, not guilty. I, was, oh, I didn't go, cheer, cheer. I just dumbfounded as the jury walked out. I'm still looking. Do they say not guilty? I couldn't believe it. Not guilty for that. Oh, God almighty. Thank God you can't be tried twice. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so earlier I talked about the Huda Thunk It move where the guy did all the mouth draw down, the chin boss. This is not that move. This is an illustrator for a throwaway story that he is. I, I think what he's doing here is severity hardening, Chase. I think he probably did go out there maybe thinking I'm going to have to kill the guy or whatever. But I don't think he went there planning to hit the guy. He probably got into a bind with the guy and shot him. I mean, I think somewhere in the middle here because... His body language is not that of a person who's like, yeah, and I killed him and it was not a drive down. There's uncertainty in his face. He does show surprise that everyone believed it. And that's good surprise. And he shows skepticism with that one brow up. So interesting. I think this is more storytelling somewhere is in is somewhere in the middle as to whether he went there to kill him. Or he went there to do something when he's talking about I commit I've been taking their money. He had taken drug dealers and, and smaller criminals and tortured them in exchange for he would torture them until they gave him enough money to stop. So he made a business out of it, and that's how he got by. That's what he got. Yeah, I, uh, most of this is fake. It just doesn't fit his tough guy narrative that we've been talking about. All the same behaviors you've heard for the last few videos. Scott? I'm with you guys. It's 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 a little bit odd. Everything um, looks the way it should. His illustrators are landing where they should and how they should. But it's uh, it's just it's a little bit, it's a little weak. Uh, even I mean, it, that's the thing. This guy's like he's over here, but he's over here. One video before we learn what the truth is, it looks like he's lying. But then it almost looks like it's it's honest in the second one. I don't, I don't know. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think for me, when he's being honest, I think he doesn't take the part of the other person in there. In this one, he takes the part of the other person. You know, in the in the earliest video where I think he's being honest about the first part of this of this murder, he actually makes somebody the other character in it. And for me, that's that's a good attachment to say, look, I wasn't that person, you be that person over here. Here he's got a great opportunity to to map out for us what the other person did the interviewer here isn't just an interviewer it isn't just you know a, a, a woman for him to kind of play up to and go oh you know i got a woman here let me play up let me put up bravado this is the representative of 60 minutes australia which is not only a massive show in australia but but here we are you know in in canada the us the uk you know all across the world we are uh you know taking apart a show that's made in australia this is a massive world hit i think he knows that i think he knows sure he's been in you know he's had films made about him he's written books but 60 minutes australia is big league and i think you know he's going to put on a good big act and play it up because this is his last this is his last performance so he's going to go out on a on a bang Of course, we were kidnapping them and taking their bloody money and, and all, all the rest of it. But, buddy, um, 
Basically, that was it. We just kidnap them, we take them, bash them, and smash them, and bash them, and smash them, and um, <laughs> give them a good eye and then let them go. This violence that you have in you, yeah. the rage that you have in you. It's not did a you, rage. It's not a rage. Did you did you learn it, or did you were you born with it? Do you reckon? Uh, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, what does your family think of your line of work? My father was... <laughs> he was tickled pink. He, <laughs> he'd roll around the floor right laughing. And uh, my mother was uh, horrified into, into absolute um, denial. She just used to uh, um, say that she was no, rel no, rel no relative of mine. She thought you were mad, didn't she? Yeah, she always believed me to be insane, you know. Yeah. All right, Chase, what do you got? Uh, this is the exact description of what he's just assured us violence is and that he is not. So I want you to watch these eyebrows after he says, let them go. This is a classic stare of waiting to see if a story was bought by the other person. He gets no reaction, so you can see them soften, and it's it's perfectly timed. After about one second, you can see the eyebrows soften up. The acting is somewhere between Power Rangers and General Hospital uh, in this one here. Greg? Yeah, I don't know if I'd give him that much credit. It might, this might be um, Kung Fu movies acting. <laughs> Because its timing is about as accurate. The bash them and smash them. That sounds like it comes straight, straight, straight from a stage play. Look, I bash them and smash them. And then he's got filler. They're just throwaway words. This is just stuff for him to be able to say something when he's rolling along. However, when he's asked the question about born with it, or it, was it something he learned? He goes into internal voice for one of the best we'll ever see. Guys, we always talk about internal voice when a person's having this kind of conversation with self and they're looking down their left and thinking there's nine seconds of him doing that followed by a skeptic eyebrow raise. And then he shows, she actually shows some emotional eye access and she looks down to her right, raises one shoulder, shows some disgust and eye blocks as she's sitting there thinking about this guy's life. It's really interesting to watch her. She has him in an actual contemplation we haven't seen to now. And so you get to a point where you're wondering what's inside this guy. How much of this is bravado? How much of this is how how much pain, how much lack of trust, how much of all the rest of those things that you didn't see are actually going on? At one point, when she gets him to this point where he's in contemplation, he's got his face broken away and he doesn't actually see her face do that uh, look that he so much desires. I think part of his entire thing is shock act, Mark, to get a reaction from people and then he plays on it. When, when he says, my mother thought I was insane, he does kind of a dis look of maybe I am, maybe a dismissal thing, but he genuinely looks like it matters to him that his mother thought that. His voice tone, his cadence, both shift and soften when he's talking about his mother. Very different speech patterns. Go back and listen to it. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just a few behavioral things. Uh, clearly, he's not connected at all with the idea of rage or violence, wants to discount that completely. Um, you know, we got that moment there of meet the parents where you got one parent who who uh, thinks the son's violent is violence is hilarious and another parent who thinks he's mad. That's that's not a good combination. Uh, so, uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't doesn't uh, excuse this man's behavior. But, uh, you know, often when you look at the parents, you go, well, you know, that's not a surprise, is it that that that, you know, this human being occurred. Uh, now, tattoos, they're always interesting. We had a lovely kind of shot of the tattoos and, and often they're used as, as uh, social proof to go, look, I'm part of this team, part of this group. I've never seen tattoos, like maybe I don't see enough tattoos and I don't see enough prison to Australian prison tattoos, but that's nothing like I would have expected. Uh, of of tattoos and it's they're kind of they're kind of quite you know beautiful and kind of like a 
I don't know, like uh, like a starlit night across his chest or some kind of wavy. It's it's quite childish in a, in a way, not what I would expect at all. It's rather like my grandmother used to sell wallpaper and it just reminds me of some of the 19 kind of 70s, 1980s wallpaper patterns. And I don't know why, I just can't work out why he'd ask for those designs and go, I oh, know, I oh, know, because, uh, you know, somebody would go, Chopper, we can give you some really severe tattoos here, make you look like some kind of Russian, you know, <laughs> criminal you know or, or japanese you know in his like no what i'd like is something just kind of soft and squidgy kind of going across the whole body there something quite beautiful something quite lyrical going okay. so i wonder whether we're getting a look with those tattoos at something that is actually inside him this some kind of little child that's inside him that wants all those kind of childish squiggles or maybe i don't know enough about australian prison tattoos and and that is the signal that he's a complete badass I'm not sure. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, well, apparently you don't know about those, but I've seen that picture of you at the beach where you have that big <laughs> eagle on there, and it's Greg's head, his face is on the eagle's face, and he's got a rose in his mouth. <laughs> I've seen that, and it's on, it's on the net somewhere. That's You're not supposed to that. show that. No. Nope. Yeah, I'm a real <laughs> We mean him. Notes. But Google it. You'll find it. Um, and you guys are right. The interviewer, she's showing this doubt and being unsure about what he's talking about. I don't think she believes this at all and then when he starts talking about his 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 childhood where his father was a criminal and his mother you know uh, he didn't say his father was a criminal but i would guess that's what was going on and it, because he thinks what he's doing is funny and apparently his father was fairly violent with him when he was a child and his mother is you know disowned him that's what he's saying anyway that's where we're seeing these these expressions of pain and grief and um eye blocking when he's talking about his mother saying that stuff about him and i think he's trying to block that stuff that the pain of that uh by blocking his eyes and turning his head a little bit it looks like he's been slapped or something so i think he's trying to block that out because that's that's got to be painful for him you know that vision of his mom saying that stuff or at least thinking that stuff as he goes through it you guys covered everything so that's all i got chopper was only months away from going back to prison this time for shooting bikey boss sid collins because he was the national president of Outlaw Motorcycle Club, I was supposed to donate $8,000 to his bloody wedding. So all the people that were coming to the wedding, the, the main people, had to bring eight grand. I'm not giving him eight grand for his bloody wedding. I don't even know how to ride a motorbike. You know? Uh, anyway, what all these bloody bikies want me to invite me to their bloody weddings for? You've got to bring bloody large amounts of money. <laughs> Stick it up, you bum. And is that why you shot him? Yes. What more do you need? Bang, get a bit, get a bit of that into you. <laughs> and then you well, had him driven to hospital. Well, I said, you want one of the brain? No. And I said, when you go under the lemon tree or out in, into the hospital, where, where do, you, you, do you tell them people? No. You don't tell them people? You, you stick solid? Yes. Won't go give me up? No. All right, good. So we can take you to hospital and you remain silent? Yes. Word on that? Yes. I believe you. Right, yeah, take him to hospital. But Sid Collins broke this baffling criminal code by going to police. Chopper spent the next six years here at Risdon Prison. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just some themes that are coming up in this, which I think is interesting and kind of marks him out uh, as under that umbrella of antisocial personality disorder because we have ideas of codes, fairness, honesty, uh, social events are talked about, retribution. So, so all, all of those things are actually quite social, aren't they? You know, you've got to have a code to be part of society. Yeah, absolutely. Fairness, that's important for being in a society. And he mentions this idea or, or certainly alludes to this idea of fairness, honesty. If you, you've got to be honest if you want to be part of a society. Um, social events. If you're part of a society, you so, show up at social events. Or you may have ideas about social events. And then retribution. If people don't do the right thing at social events, like <laughs> give you a bill for eight grand, then retribution is, is clearly going to be. So look, when we talk about uh, you know an antisocial uh, behavior or personality, um, often within their own group it's actually quite social like in his mind all he's doing is is 
paying back fairly what should be paid to somebody when they go and ask you for an eight grand to show up to a wedding. Yeah, you punish them for that because it isn't fair. It's not honest and it's not the code that's expected. Now to us as outsiders, we're not, I mean, it's interesting. This guy was, um, was a one percenter. So he's a, he's a biker. He's a, uh, he wasn't a hell's angel, but he's, you know, he's patched up. So oh. Yeah, he's, he's one of those groups call themselves the one percenters because they see themselves as the one percent who are outside of society. Uh, well, even for Chopper, he reckoned you're way outside of society. You've done exactly the wrong thing by charging me eight grand. Now you need punishing. So that's how far out of society Chopper is. He's outside of even the one percent. He won't even join in with the eight grand to the outsiders. He's, he's an outsider of the of even the outsiders. He's way out there. Uh, what an extraordinary character. Only, only in Australia, I reckon. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? I'll bet we could probably find one of those somewhere other than Australia. <laughs> I might have lived next door to one of these guys and not known it. So he does that. He does a lot of bluster. This guy needs to be recognized as he's just so cool. I'm, the reason he shot him is because he asked for 8,000. I don't even ride a motorcycle. That's really the reason. <laughs> but he you knows his way when he thinks he scored a point and he's not sure you got it. That you know, pay attention to because you know, you know. That's just a way for him to double check and make sure you understand that he just said something kind of flippant and funny and cool and glib. Glib might be the word we should use for him. His conversation is illustrating, and he he doesn't have filters when he's going through what happened and why I shot him and that. So I believe it. This is one of those where you can see it and believe it because he's going on about why he did it and what he did. Um, look at the consistency after he says, you know, then he will have the same kind of behavior. And this conversation, this cadence is flowing, and it's badminton-like. She'll say something, he'll say something. That's a pretty good indicator. This is normal conversation. He's not trying to just run down there. But, again, even when he's telling the truth, He's got to have the chopper act. So that's what I got. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, this sounds and looks honest for the most part. But the, fi the part I find questionable is when he's explaining there was a conversation about where he should shoot this guy. And he's talking to him about it. That makes no sense. I've never heard that before in my life. Anybody say, no, nah, you want me to shoot you in the head? You want me to shoot you in the stomach? What do you want? You want a gut shot or a head shot? It's, it's you, man. You just tell me. It's, it's all about you. <laughs> that, that's not going to happen. I don't think it's, but I, and I think he made that up in prison. So it would sound cool. We gave him a story to tell what happened. Now here's what happened because he got nailed for it and he's in prison and it didn't seem like that big a deal. So I think to be the big deal he was, I think that's what had to happen. I think he had to, he had to uh, make something up, but his laughter is back. His illustrators are really small and they're close to his body. That's another part of it that bothers me. I, I feel like it, it's true because he shot the guy. But the story, like we've heard uh, uh, coming along, this he's just adding things to it. These qualifiers, all this, all these, this fabrication, this exaggeration of what actually happened to make himself sound cooler. Chase, what do you got? I think there's some truth to this one, and I don't think the discussion happened at all like this. I think he didn't die from a single bullet, and Chopper was about to finish it, but the guy begged or something else happened. The only fluctuations in the story are around this exact detail. There's a distinct drop in his fluency and all of his movements around this detail. He's got to have a story to make him sound cool. I didn't, because this goes back to like, I'm going to shoot somebody and they're going to die. That doesn't happen when you get shot in the belly. Uh, most of the time, actually, when you get shot in the belly, you don't die unless it days and days go by, you de develop some kind of septicemia or something. So I think it, it was an accident that he didn't finish it. He thought the death was going to happen and some kind of thing ensued afterward that doesn't make him look like a badass. So something else was invented. That's all I got. It just sucks a lot when you get shot in the stomach. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those things like when you get the flu real bad and you're afraid you're going to die because you're puking so much and then you're afraid you're not going to die because you're puking so much <laughs> 10 years later yeah about you, 10 years later yeah. you track him down in casino no 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 we're in casino new south wales doing a talk night talk night me and jacko doing a talk night who do you think comes up to me after the talk night and wants me to sign a piece of memorabilia Hello? Hello, Trevor. You sign this? 
I can't believe it. What, what are you doing here? Oh, bygones are bygones? Are you sign this? No. I'm not signing anything with you. I'm not signing anything. Uh, I can't even believe oh, don't even believe it, you know? And uh, I'll see you backstage, eh? Come and talk to us backstage. He was there. <laughs> oh, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Mad. Idiot. Completely insane. Off his head on cocaine. Right. And so what happened then? Oh, I'm not going to tell you what happened then, but we took him, oh, I've got him in a... I hopped into his car, going back to his place, bang, 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 bang. And uh, I shot him the last time with his gun. I killed him this time with his gun. That's how stupid he is. <laughs> I shot him the first time with his gun. I shot him the second time with his gun. How stupid is this person? This is an idiot, complete idiot. And this time, yeah. were you shooting to kill him? Oh, yeah, this time I was shooting to kill him. Last time he just got it in the guts and a trip to hospital. Very Christian last time. Not this time. Bang. Why did you murder him? Because he was an absolute turd. All right, Chase, what do you got? There's some bizarre behavior here. This, we're seeing this unflinching need for recognition and approval from the interviewer. And I don't think this is true whatsoever. I'm going to walk you through just a sample of what's in this clip. And I wish I had time to walk you through all the details, but I think you'll get most of it. I'm just going to give you the body language names of everything here without explaining it to you like a, a course. Here we go. There's fidgeting going through the roof here. There's continuous looks off camera. There's a break from bait, which is a huge break from baseline. There's a vocal pitch way higher than normal, increased speed, increased rate of speech, loss of fluency, detail spikes, avoiding uh, the exact question, increased bodily rigidity, a humorous freeze. This arm comes in here for fear. There's digital flexion, multiple spikes in hesitancy, hiding time, large postural shift during the beginning of the answer, immediate postural retreat after the answer uh, of admission of killing. There's postural swaying during the increasing vocal pitch that's deception scott what do you got i agree with you and, it, and when he's answering he put you're right he pulls his legs in his his arms tighten up his cadence is way too fast there's way too many pauses in there and there's that odd laughter again and then the second half he makes too much strong eye contact and he's moving around and, and squishing around too much it's just, the whole thing seems off he's mumbling about 25 30 percent of the time he's uncomfortable and he skips over the e t the details of the actual shooting and just says bang 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 it's just this this doesn't work for me at all greg what do you got yeah he does hard eye contact from under the brow with his chin down we typically associate the chin down with throat protection usually when you're you know you're trying to hide something that he's signaling some of the right stuff he's signaling that he's incredulous the only thing he's missing is a gasp, right? That's the only thing he's missing because he's got his chin down, his face back. The narrowing of the mouth and widening of the eyes, I think I associate with anger or residual, some kind of displeasure. If the guy did show up, this might be what he wished he had done. And then there's disgust at he wants me to sign a piece of memorabilia. You can see his nose up and both sides of his mouth are down. I, he's emphatic. The only thing that is interesting to me and makes me think there's a possibility is he is real and emphatic and not jovial as he calls a guy a real turd, an absolute turd. That part makes me go, hmm, is it just anger and some of that stuff did play out? Maybe it's causing him to behave this way. Don't know. But what I do see here is all the markers that we typically associate with deception and his baseline has changed. I still believe he could have some involvement, but maybe things don't play out the way he talks about him. You know, he could have the guy whack because could have done something himself because and a lot of this bravado and stuff that goes with it didn't happen mark what do you got yeah i, I agree the absolute turd bit is 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 pretty honest and i think that comes from you know not that i know anything about the guy who is calling that um but uh but he feels it's honest uh and i think that comes from the idea that he's cleaning up society he's cleaning up and that speaks to me about a psychopathic trait there often with people who would fall under that umbrella there can be a sense of i'm just doing this to make the world a better place cleaning up 
the uh, the excrement that is the rest of uh, living human beings out there. There's also themes here of paranoia. I think his theme of paranoia is absolutely true. I think he is paranoid. Uh, there's themes of entertainment. He's wholly entertaining. I think that's honest and true for him. He does like to entertain. He the, the theme there of the absurdity of the situation and the irony of the situation that this guy would show up and ask for, you know, an autographed copy. Did it happen? Did it not happen? Doesn't really matter because it's just ironic and absurd and therefore entertaining and shows and shows a breaking of a code clearly it's the code of if you're a criminal if you're one percenter you do not show up to ask for somebody's autograph you just don't do that and if you do that you deserve being cleaned up out of out of this society here's what i love is that this this um this new story he starts to look to camera on the punchlines his punchline is that's how stupid he is and i think and maybe he's done this story before in a theater or and maybe it's been slightly taken away from the fact that he might have done a a, a violent act and been part of murder because i assume this is the moment where he's confessing and he wouldn't have done that in in a theater piece unless you can say well i wrote it i'm making it up maybe he could so maybe he has done it in a theater piece but i think in a theater when he's been in a club or and done and done this line of that's how stupid he is he's used to getting a laugh on that and he doesn't get a laugh from the crowd here and he looks he looks to the camera like damn where's my because that's the awful thing if you if you're used to doing comedy in theaters and then you start doing comedy on tv like you see it with performers all the time when they've done it in theaters and then now doing it in the studio it's like yeah that that camera won't laugh back you're gonna have to get used to the fact of imagining the laughter you're gonna get well he doesn't get any laughter back so he plays the line again which is beautifully naive and he doesn't get a laugh the second time either so yeah for me it's it's an act, but with some strong themes that are real for him. Cleaning up the world and paranoia about who's in it and, and loving to entertain and enjoying the absurdity and the irony of this outsider lifestyle. What did you do with the body? We stick him in the we stuck him in a hole and filled the hole in, as Where, one does. Whereabouts was that? Casino New South Wales. Can you be more specific? Do you mean? New South Wales. I'm not going to go and dig it up for you. I couldn't dig it up for you myself. I, 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 I would forget. It was bloody somewhere near a bloody football oval. Somewhere near a football oval. Yeah, about 50 feet away from a football oval on the, on the other side of a big uh, mound of bloody dirt. That's all I remember. Do you reflect on that at all? I mean, you know, his son told police he was miss missing, reported him missing. There's a family there looking yeah, for, yeah. for a dad who's, who's no longer around. Any yeah. remorse, any sort no, of reflection no, on that? No, no, none at all. None at all. None at all. Absolutely none at all. No. None at all. What does it feel like to kill someone? did not feel anything at all. Nothing. Nothing. <sighs> An adrenaline rush? No, didn't feel a thing. No. I didn't get no adrenaline rush, nothing. Fear? No, nothing. No sense of fear. No sense of foreboding or anything like that, nothing. No. Sense of power? No, no, no sense of power. Nothing like that at all. No. Mm. So no sense of looking over your shoulder, did anyone see it? That's about it. Mm. Mm. What do you expect me to say? Man, that's too bad. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? Well, first, just listen to the guy's cadence. Every look in the last one, I was saying, well, maybe he's involved some way. Well, this cleans it up. Yeah, no, this guy. When you listen to this, first thing chin down throat protecting listen to his cadence drift off he says i would forget i would forget he's trying to come up with a reason why he doesn't know where it's where the body's at and 
touches his face for the first time in every video we've seen. We usually associate that with trying to comfort self. And sometimes when we're thinking, but usually when you're doing something like it was bloody somewhere near. And then he progressively gives more and more vague detail. It was somewhere near football field. Well, 50 feet from a football field, 50 yards from a football field. Oh, by a pile of dirt. All progressively more vague and less disclosing. His blink rate as he's doing that is through the roof. Right here, you think he's making it up because everything's changing. And then my other, my favorite part of the whole thing, he does none at all. And then his arms cross and he starts doing the kind of the chained elephant in his chair while denying he feels anything. He does lip compression at no foreboding. And then when she says, what do you expect me to say? Or when he says, what do you expect me to say? My notes, what I said is a lot less. It feels like you're negotiating and filling in the list of other feelings she hasn't considered. If you don't feel anything, you wouldn't be listing off the feelings that other people have because you don't know what they are. You've already told us that. So I think this is BS. Um, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, the bits that I don't think are BS is, is his mockery of empathy. So there's there's that. Uh, yeah, 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 I'll just call it that. Mockery of, of, of empathy and his resignation, that sigh that he does, this resignation to not having any feelings about this. Now, that's not to say he doesn't have any feelings whatsoever, but I would suggest they are so shallow and and out of touch that for him, it just doesn't feel like he has he has feelings like like are required for him uh there's definitely a feeling of paranoia i think the looking over your shoulder that's a true feeling that he has and uh you know just because you're not because just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're out to get you and, he, and people would be out to get him uh many many times um yeah that's all i got on that one scott what do you got I think this one's interesting because it's the first time we see him making one up on the fly. I think he's just got the opening and said, all right, here we go. And he's just telling the story. He's just making it up as he goes along. He starts adapting on his mouth. His illustrators are minimal and his cadence is really fast. His tone is high. And he's got way too many additives to what he's talking about, way too many qualifiers. And those are actually late when he adds them. Um, he's got too much strong eye contact, which is similar to some of the videos we've seen before. So I think he's just making this up. I don't think there's any, any big deal here as as far as the validity goes. I don't think there is any at this point. Chase, what do you got? It's fake. Y'all got it all. <laughs> okay. Well, that's all technical, but I think what Chase is saying. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, let's go around the room and talk about what we think we've seen in about 30 seconds or less and wrap it up. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Great, great entertainer in the in the mold of all of those, uh, you know, gangland entertainers where we are looking for the most socially unacceptable acts to hear about, to look at, to hear the stories of. And I think that's what he's trying to give us. Has he been involved in in? Well, obviously, we know he's been involved in extremely violent acts. That's for sure. And has he been involved in murders? Undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly he has. Um, are they as he maps out in these? No, these are beautiful exaggerations for our entertainment. He's an entertainer. This film's about him. He's on 60 Minutes. He's an entertainer. Um, quite delightful in some ways. In some other ways, not at all. But that's the allotropic nature of it. You want to look and you want to look away. That's the bedlam. That's the horror of it. You, you, you know you shouldn't look, but you have to. Chase, what do you think? Yeah, this is just a classic example of an emotionally stunted individual who wants to rewrite the past to make himself tougher. No doubt he's had a rough life, I'm sure. He's involved in lots of criminal behavior, but so much of this is just false. The details that I believe are fabricated tell us a pretty sad story of a man who feels insignificant and weak. And this new diagnosis that he's dealing with right now might be a part of the reason for this, this need to rewrite, you know, what went on in his life. I think there's a lot more to his behavior than whatever is causing the jaundice here, but it's a boy in a man's body who didn't grow up all the way, still wanting to gain respect through shock value and toughness. And I think it's a good reminder for all of us to just drop the mask more often and just live it out in front of our eyes. 
when we're around people. And it's a good example of what it might look like when we're just behind our eyes trying to modify perceptions all the time. Greg? Yeah, he's, he might be a little boy, but he's a little monster of a little boy. He's done horrific things to people. The interesting piece is that he chose most of his violence to be against people who live outside society to start with, so they can't go get help. I mean, that's an interesting turn of events when a person is preying on other people who prey on other people. You might think of that as a hero until you hear some of the stuff he did. And then I think he's a Joe Pesci character. You know, Joe Pesci in any criminal movie is over the top. Good fellows, go watch it. Even the guys around him, he ends up getting killed because he's so crazy. And if you're making yourself out to be that crazy, you're grandizing in that environment. Remember, we're talking about Maslow. You want to be the baddest crazy there is, you just keep adding to it. Probably people just who knew him would know a lot of that, and you would get words from them. But then he became famous. And when, once people are famous, then you know that they're going to be aggrandized by people who knew them as well. So, I, look, I think... Most of this is just bluster and an image and a stage act. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I think this is, this is a great example of watching someone who has had, at the beginning of their life, it was fairly exciting because he was being violent, being a tough guy and all that. As he got older and got sick or started losing his health, he's, like you guys were saying, he's got to to, to end, have a great ending for his, his third act. Is it three acts, Mark, or four? Uh, three. Okay, so the ending of the third act um, has to be this big, the big closer, as he said at the beginning when he was talking about that, the last picture show. So I think he knows that, and, sub, and, and subconsciously he's playing all that out, trying to make himself look cool or trying to make himself look tougher because that's all he's got. He's leaving some books, some kids' books nobody's going to read, and, and I think that's all he's got, and a movie. Uh, and, and a rap album. Yeah, <laughs> does he really? <laughs> It's not on Spotify, so it didn't hit big. So. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, I think that's what it is. I think it's just a, a, a poor old guy who was mean and uh, has, like Mark was saying, he's got psychopathic tendencies. I don't think he's a psychopath, but I think he's really, I think he's a hardcore criminal. And I think he lived the life of that and paid the consequences of that. And now he's just a, a sad old man who's going to die a, a, a death, probably alone. You know, or when he dies, probably alone. Gosh, how depressing to end something like that. But I'm sure things are better now for him. You know, well, I'm sure the the, the Mad Charlie story is much more, you know, joyous and upbeat. <laughs> you know, if we can find out what I'll, I'll go. I'll try what to find Mad, Mad Charlie. Charlie. That'll be our future story. <laughs> that'll be that'll be the next. Scott, one. you went a minute twenty. That was not thirty seconds. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dang it. sorry, man. I went on. But, oh well. All right, all right, fellas. Well, I think this was a good one, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?